Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Well, I'd like to add my uh, welcome to Andrew's welcome and uh, his sunrise breakfast. I've never made that, although I did do breakfast on the beach yesterday at Le Coup. In fact, we did, uh, we did three barbecues yesterday, uh, or a brine in South African terms. We did breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So the season has definitely started, and a few um, pink faces in here this morning. Anyone get sunburned yesterday? Yeah, a little bit. Tim, I sp- spotted Tim. Marcus, bad. Um, so uh, welcome to, to Freedom Church. I, I just want to, um, you probably sat on one of these pieces of paper. This is a, a new course we're starting at the Freedom Center in May. It's called Alpha, and it's all about Jesus. Um, and it's a great, great opportunity to, to come along. It's actually a movie series which has been filmed all over the world. So, so for example, um, uh, around the birth and the, and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, they go to Jerusalem, and they actually take you to the places where Jesus was. So if you'd lived 2,000 years ago in that hood, you would have met him. And, uh, but the great news is you can still meet him today by his spirit. And I'm going to be speaking about that this morning. Um, but we've been doing this, this sort of mini-series, I guess. And uh, the first was Andrew, where he started talking about accessorize. Now, if you know Andrew, he's all man. I mean, there, there's nothing um, sort of effeminate about Andrew. And, and when he started talking about accessorize, I was thinking, I just couldn't reconcile Andrew going into that shop, accessorize, uh, you know, and, and buying some little pink ribbons and bows. Um, but uh, the good news is he, um, he wasn't talking about that at all. In fact, what he was talking about was, was how, how Jesus Christ is foundational to, to his life and to his faith. You know, listening to John and Jen, I, I really need to honor them because they are remarkable humans. Um, you know, in the midst of, of all uh, the pain that they've gone through as a family over the last three weeks, they, it, for me, it's really a great testimony that, that Christ is foundational to them. And I love what John shared earlier where he said, you know, where else can you go? You know, where else can you go? Because Jesus has the words of eternal life. And if you want to hear other testimony, Jess and Anna will be sharing testimony on, on Greb Delek and Corey later on. And the sun is out. God is good and the sun shines on the righteous. Last, uh, and the unrighteous, and me. Um, and, uh, and Tim shared last week that, 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 that not only is, is Jesus Christ foundational, but he's also the lens through which we see the world. So he's also the lens through which we, we see perspective or we gain greater perspective. And, and I, loved, I love what Tim shared because he says, as you put all the decisions that you make through that filter, it, it makes it much easier to make decisions. And, and so this morning, I want to... I want to look at the whole subject, uh, or, the, or the whole topic of your body is a temple. Your body is a temple, and uh, and I, I'm going to expand on that in a minute. But but I, I find it very, quite interesting because as I was preparing for this, I was thinking about how how um, the world says we should really worship our bodies or worship other people's bodies, and actually that that our bodies should be that kind of object of worship. And yet, and yet the Bible says that our bodies are not objects of worship, but objects for worship. And I think there's a big difference between the two. The fact that if I asked you the question, is your body a temple, your mind might spring to ideas of, uh, of working out or, or eating healthily or, or, or whatever. But, but actually, as, as, I, as I look at this whole thing today, I want to see that actually our bodies are temples of the living God, that actually we're kingdom carriers of God's presence into the world. And, and actually, that could be quite a daunting task if you think, well, I'm a kingdom carrier. I mean, how, how is my body, you know, how is my mind, how is, how is Nigel Strachan adequate to carry the presence of God, the, the kingdom of God, into the world? But it's very clear from the Bible that, that we are, in fact, kingdom carriers. And, and we shouldn't be daunted by the prospect. We shouldn't be daunted by the fact that God chooses to presence himself in us and, uh, and, you know, Tim referred to, to living stones. You know, we are, we, are, we are temples of the living God. We are, we are carriers of His presence. And so I want to look at, um, I guess, the tail end of that reading that, that we've been looking at in Ephesians chapter 2. And, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to pray. So if we just get that reading up, that would be great. So this is in Ephesians chapter 2. And this is just two verses, uh, 21 and 22. We're going to look at three readings this morning. This is the first one. And it says, in this reading, it says, In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. 
And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Isn't that amazing? A dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So I want to look at three things this morning. So the first thing I want to look at is is the fact that we are holy temples. We are holy temples. We are, we are dwelling places for the living God. That's the first thing I want to look at this morning. And I want to look at a bit of the history of the temple. The second thing I want to look at is the fact that we are kingdom carriers. So we carry the presence of God into this world, into your workplace, into your sports clubs, into your coffee shops, into your, your uh, uh, circles of influence. You are kingdom carriers. And the final thing I want to look at is the fact that we are whether you like it or not, we're being built together. We're being built together as living stones in God's kingdom. So as you look at that, let's just, uh, let's just bow our heads and, and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that we can come into your presence. Lord, we thank you that even though we are, I guess, unholy, we can come into the presence of a holy God because of what you've done. Lord, we thank you that we can stand before the living God with all our inadequacies, with all our failings, with all our faults. Lord, we thank you that you're building us together. And so, Lord Jesus, we just pray this morning that as we come in the next 25 minutes before your word, Lord, we pray that your spirit would open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds to receive what you have to say. And so we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, so as I say, we, we, I'm going to be looking, first of all, at the whole idea of being a holy temple, of being a holy temple. Now, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know um, how you feel on some mornings, particularly early mornings, but I have to say some early mornings, I just don't feel like an, a holy temple. Um, you know, the, the alarm will go off, particularly when I'm getting the red eye, uh, which my boss finds quite funny that I call it a red eye. He says, it's not a red eye, it's a seven o'clock flight, Nigel. A red eye is when you have to fly overnight, all night, and then get up for a meeting. But, um, but let's call it the red eye. And, and you, get, you get up, so my alarm goes off at five, and, and I, kind of, I sort of creep out of bed and try not to wake Lou up. And, uh, and you know, then, and then shine. And Pete, I know Peter's always, he's always waiting to hear my footsteps to go down the stairs, because he knows that if I'm awake, then he can go downstairs and build Lego. But we don't encourage building Lego at 5.45 in the morning, um, because it makes for grumpy children later in the day. But, uh, but, but if I'm honest, I often don't feel like a holy temple. Um, and, I, and I just don't feel perhaps that day that I'm going to be a great vessel for God. And, and wherever God's going to take me, I always believe and I always pray for opportunities. And I, and I always pray actually three things. I pray that God would give me opportunities to speak of his goodness. That's the first thing I always pray for. Um, the, the, the second thing I always pray for is that have, I'd have opportunities to build relationships and the third thing I pray for um, is that I'd have opportunities to win new business because that's my job. And, um, and, and actually, you know, as I, as I pray that, I then, I then say to God, I, I don't know how the day is going to go, but I do know that, um, that you are with me. And I do know that there will be conversations where I can take your presence. And, and I, I guess I'm encouraged by the fact that sometimes I don't always feel like it, but I know that God is still at work, that God is still going to use me even despite, or despite my feelings. And, uh, and I want to hit you with some truth this morning. I guess some, some facts to counter the feelings, because if you're anything like me, you sometimes need these facts. And the first fact is, in Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible says that God gives us His Holy Spirit. Okay, He gives us His Holy Spirit. So when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, so we accept Him, I guess, in, in the driving position, in pole position in our lives, He gives us His Holy Spirit to help us live the Christian life. And, and, and in, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, He not only gives us this, it's a deposit guaranteeing our future inheritance. So, so I know that, that despite my feelings, I know that one day, um, despite how my day or my week or my year is going, I am going to inherit eternal life, which is a pretty good thing, right? And, and I know that, that I have that deposit, uh, like a deposit on a home, like any deposit you'd put down on a, my, that deposit has been purchased by the blood of Jesus, and 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 that is a, that is a deposit guaranteeing uh, my future inheritance. So that that's the first thing. The second thing is I take encouragement from John chapter four, where Jesus talks about living water. The, this morning when we got together before the service, we were praying, and, and Terry prayed this prayer. You know, God gives us His Spirit, and what it becomes in us is a spirit of a, a spring of living water. 
which wells up to eternal life. Now, that doesn't happen instantly. You know, John often pr- talks about we're being changed from one degree of glory to another. That doesn't happen instantly. That is a process. And, and so I know that, that, that even though I may not always feel like it, there is a spring in me of living water that is welling up to eternal life. And others might see that in you. I know other people have, have spoken into my life, and they said, Nigel, I recognize that in you, and you mustn't be discouraged on the days that you don't always feel like God is with you. So that becomes in us a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. And the other, the other truth I hold on to is in Ephesians chapter 5, which says we go on being filled with the Spirit. So it isn't a sort of once-off thing that happens. Every day we go on being filled with the Spirit. And, uh, and, and you might think, well, that seems a bit strange. And, and John in the worship was sharing, you know, we, we mustn't be scared of the Holy Spirit. I, I know certainly growing up I knew a lot about God the Father, and I knew a lot about God the Son. But if I'm honest, I didn't know a lot about God the Holy Spirit. I was thinking, you know, what is this Holy Spirit? It seems a bit weird. Is he some sort of ethereal ghost who kind of turns up from time to time? But, you know, the, if we didn't have the Holy Spirit, God couldn't be with all of us all the time. It would be physically impossible. You know, Jesus, as a person, could only have been in uh, Judea and Samaria at different times. He couldn't have been there at the same time. If somebody says to you, I, I, I know I can't be with you on your birthday in body, but I'm with you in spirit. You should say, that's not true, right? Because if your body's not there, your spirit is not there. However, God's spirit can be with us all the time. And, and, that, and that might blow your mind, that the, the presence of the living God can be in all of us all the time. But that's how we become holy temples. And, and sometimes I don't think it's always about how much, um, how much of the Holy Spirit I have. I think it's how much the Holy Spirit has of me, and I think that varies from day to day. So, so for me, it's a, it's a surrender thing. So, so I'm proud, I'm stubborn, and sometimes I don't like to cede ground to God's Spirit because it's hard work, because I have to become more patient, and I have to become more kind, and I have to become more gentle, and I have to become more thoughtful. And, and you notice I say I have to because I don't always choose to, right? And, and, and actually... Actually, as I see ground to the Spirit of God, I, I do, if I'm honest, I do see um, other people notice. And other people say, Nigel, I have noticed you've become more patient in that area. I have noticed you've become more gentle in that area. I have noticed you've become, um, you've had more self-control in that area. Because these are fruits of the Holy Spirit. And so as we see ground to the Spirit of God, and, and actually we start to surrender our lives, we have to surrender some of our pride. And we have to surrender some of our stubbornness. And actually, I, I love the fact that um, Jess and Anna and Corey are getting baptized today. Because for me, that's a step of obedience. It's a step of surrender. It's a step of public declaration. You're saying, I am ready to surrender more of my life to you, Jesus. And so, and so the Holy Spirit for me is not kind of some kind of weird, ethereal ghost that just kind of turns up once in our lives. He is the Spirit of God who continues to work in and through us. And the Bible promises that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion. He doesn't sort of come once and then, and then stop. I actually quite like J. John's analogy of, of the Spirit of God in our lives. And he says, you know, sometimes we invite God into the car of our lives, okay, but we put him in the boot. And we say, Jesus, just, I, I, we just want you to hang around in the boot and we'll bring you out on Sundays. And we get to church on Sunday and we unlock the boot and we take him out and uh, we walk him into church for, you know, spiritual happy hour. And, uh, and, then, and then we walk him back to our car and we put him back in the boot. And we say, just, if you just hang there for another few uh, days, we'll bring you out next Sunday. But Jesus doesn't want to be in the boots of your life, right? So then we say, actually, um, we'll take one more step and we'll invite him into the car, but not into the front seat. We'll just put him into the back seat. And we'll take the occasional direction from him. And Jesus says to us, Nigel, I don't want to be in the back seat of your life. I want to be in the front seat. You're like, well, okay, well, we can give you the passenger seat for now. And, uh, and so we, we let him have the passenger seat. And, uh, and then Jesus says, you know what, Nigel, despite what you think, I do know you better than you know yourself. And I want the driving seat. You're like, oh, I'm not quite ready to give up the driving seat. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, I want to control the speed you know, at which I go, and I want to control the, um, uh, the gear or, or, or whatever. And Jesus says, Nigel, I want to be in the driving seat of your life. And, and we find that hard, don't we? We find it hard um, handing over the controls. We ha- find it hard handing over the driving seat. 
But that's where God wants us to, to, to let him drive. So, so we reluctantly get out, and we get into the passenger seat, and, and we, we let him drive. But if you're anything like me, you're a bit of a backseat driver. You're like, I'm not sure we should be going this way. Um, and uh, despite the fact that the GPS and the TomTom is saying we should go this way. And, and, then, and then Jesus says, okay, Nigel, we're going to take a left down this road called forgiveness. And you're like, oh, I don't want to go down this road, right? Because there's a lot of people I just don't want to forgive. And he goes, well, we can, we can either do that or we can just pull the handbrake and just wait here for a while. And he's patient. But very often we don't want to go down the streets he wants to take us down. And, uh, but, but, he, but, but as we cede to God's Spirit, as we give Him ground, as we, as we surrender our lives to Him, I believe that He really starts to make real change as we let Him have the driving seat, as we let Him drive the car. So I want to I look now at the, at the brief history of the temple, um, because the Bible, as you probably know, is, is divided into two sort of main areas, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, the view of the temple was very different to the view of the temple in the New Testament. So, so the temple in the Old Testament was, was a building that people went to where um, sacrifice would be made for sin that had been um, committed. And, 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 and I guess the question is, why would people have to do that? Well, quite simply, because the Jewish people, in order to distinguish or separate themselves from other people, had these laws and the, ro- the job was for them to keep those laws, but if you're, if you're anything like me or anything like the, the Israelites, is you'd break those laws. And actually, by the end of the Old Testament, there were 678 different laws. So by the time you got to the end of any day, you probably broke quite a few of them. And, um, and so, so I guess by the end of the Old Testament, you had quite a legalistic situation where, where God's people would go to the temple and they would sacrifice animals. They would, they would shed blood. Which, which I find hard to explain to my kids, but I, I think we're getting there. We, they'd shed blood of these animals to pay for the sin. The, the, sort of the fancy word is atonement. So, so, so the blood of the animals would atone for the sin of the people. And then Jesus comes along, and he's described as the last high priest. So, and he, he, he doesn't shed the blood of animals. He sheds his own blood. He sheds his royal blood to pay for the sin of mankind once and for all. So let's look at, um, I guess, a great inflection point in the Bible where the Old Testament meets the New in Hebrews chapter 10. And that's going to come up on the screens now. So it says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his, re- his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for uh, once for all time a sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. And after that, after that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and I'll write them on their minds. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain. That is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. And having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. That was my baptism verse, Anna. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So as I said, as I said we have this great juncture, I guess, this great inflection point, this great point where, where the Old Testament meets the New in, in Hebrews, which I think is probably the best book in the Bible. And, and <laughs> just saying... <laughs> um, because, because it really, it really kind of weaves together beautifully the story of the Bible, which is, this, which is the story of, of, of mankind. And, and, and I often read the Bible, and I think, you know, I wouldn't have been like that. You know, I would have been, you know, on time, not sinning, blah, blah, blah. But, but, but actually, as I read the Bible uh, more, I, uh, it kind of resonates with me. I think, I think, you know, I'm just like these people. And even though the Israelites were stubborn and stupid and pride, prideful and, and wandered around the desert for 40 years, wasting time... You know, don't we do that to an extent? 
When, you, when we don't listen to God, when we don't surrender our lives, when you don't let Him take the driving seat. We're a bit like that, aren't we? And, I, and, actually, and actually, if you look at um, the, the kind of the pattern, which is, which is the law gets set, the law gets broken, people sin, and, and blood has to be shed. I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of amazed at the kind of stupidity of the cycle. And, and, you, and you were really waiting for a savior because, because actually in the Old Testament, in the old school way of forgiveness or, or, um, or cleansing from sin or atonement, there was really no end game. There was no solution because, because the, the blood of animals was never finally going to take away the sacrifice. Yes, it did it for a while, but it was never finally going to take away the sin of God's people. And, and then Jesus comes along this last time priest, and he, you know, he, he dies once and for all. He's the perfect and final sacrifice. And one thing I find amazing about, uh, uh, this is perhaps the greatest truth um, of Christianity in my, my life. One thing I find amazing about the sacrifice of Jesus is when Jesus did that, he made me perfect. Now, I don't know how you feel this morning, and I, I don't know if you, um, if you feel perfect, but maybe you should just look at the person next to you. Actually, do that now and just say, in God's eyes, you, name, are perfect. Just do that. Look at them and say, you are perfect. A- Andrew, you are perfect. E- even, even, even if you do go into accessorize from time to time. So this, this truth, for me, is amazing. The fact, that, the fact that, you know, you might be sitting next to your spouse or, or one of your friends or, or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or just a friend, and, and you might know a lot about them. <laughs> you might know actually so much that, that actually that the whole idea of them being perfect is, um, you know, is a crazy one, right? You're thinking, they ain't perfect, and they are a long way from perfect. But, but, but the truth is, they are perfect in God's eyes if they've accepted His Son. And, and this is something I, I hold on to, I think, more than anything, is the fact that, that God sees me as perfect, that by one sacrifice, He has made me righteous. Now, now I, wait, I don't know what, you, what, what word comes, what images come into your mind when you hear the word righteous. Maybe you think it's um, sort of, uh, holier than now, or, or, or you know, goody two-shoes, or, you know, he's very righteous, or he thinks, or she thinks she's very righteous. But the, but the biblical definition of righteousness is actually a much better one. It's, is I get God's righteousness. I get God's kind of rightness, his right standing. I can stand next to the living God, and, and I'm not going to be obliterated. Now, in the old school, in the Old Testament, that would be absolutely impossible. I mean, the best we had was Moses, you know, got sort of close to God, but he had to have a veil over his face. You know, in in the New Testament, Jesus comes and he embraces ordinary broken people like you and me, and he makes us right. You know, in our in our um, in our family, sometimes we sometimes say, "Well, nobody's perfect." Okay, I'd love to meet nobody one day, but 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 nobody (laughs) nobody's perfect, and. um, there was an Aussie rugby player a few years ago who never made any mistake, and, and actually his nickname was Nobody. Um, but, uh, but, but nobody is perfect. But actually, in Jesus, we can be made perfect, and we can stand next to the living God. I find that amazing. So every day, I can go out into my job, my workplace, I can catch a taxi, a plane, whatever, and I know that the living God is coming alongside me. You know, actually, the, the original Greek word for the Holy Spirit is parakletos, which means one who comes alongside, like a counselor. You know, it's nothing kind of weird or freaky. God comes alongside us. He comes alongside us in our pain. John and Jen have shared that. You know, the last three weeks have been painful for them. But God has come alongside them, and they've felt His presence. You know, Tim often shares this, but God never promises it's going to be a, a bed of roses, you know. Bon Jovi might have, su- might have sung that, but he's never gonna prom- he never promises it's going to be a bed of roses or peaches and cream or afternoon tea at Longville Manor. But he does say he will come alongside us in our pain. He'll come alongside us in our joy. And he does stand next to us. I find that remarkable. Um, I was at a 50th recently where I got chatting to this, this guy who's, who's colorful. 
um, if if I if I'm honest. And uh, and and he said, "How do you know the host?" And I said, "I know him from church." And he said, "Church?" He said, "Why do you go to church?" He said, "I could never go to church." He said, um, "The church would be struck down by lightning." And I said, "Why? How bad are you?" And uh, uh, he said, "You don't wanna, you don't want to know." He says, "Where do I start?" I said, "Well, I don't know. Start somewhere." Um, so he started uh, explaining to me wh- what he sort of defined as bad, <laughs> and and uh, and I think I shared a story about um, uh, uh, Carl Lentz meeting um, a drug dealer in New York and inviting him to church. The guy got saved, and as did his whole gang. And I said, "Are you as bad as that?" And the guy said, "No, I'm probably not that bad." <laughs> and I said, "Well, you know what? I I'm pretty bad." I said, "You know, but I I don't come to church because I think I'm." good, or I think I'm bad. I come to church because in, in Christ, I'm perfect. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, really. You should try. And, and I, you know, that, 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 is a, that is, I think, something where the, the world thinks I can't come to church because I'm too bad. Or perhaps I don't want to come to church um, because, you know, so much stuff has happened in my life that God would never accept me as, as one of his children. You know, but the Bible says that when God accepts us as one of his children, we become a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You know, we, bec- we, we, bec- we uh, like I shared earlier, we get the gift of his, his spirit, that his spirit becomes in us a spring of water welling up to eternal life, that, that on a daily basis we are being filled again with his spirit. And he sees me as perfect. And I don't know how you feel this morning. I don't know how perfect your Saturday night was. I don't know how perfect your week was. Um, I often don't feel perfect, but I always go back to the truth that in Jesus Christ, I am perfect. So I want to just finish with two things. Um, the first is, so we've covered the temple. We've covered the fact that, you know, in, in Jesus, we are, we are living temples. We are, we are carriers of his Holy Spirit. But I want to I address, I- in my penultimate point, the whole idea of being a kingdom carrier. And I love this idea of being a kingdom carrier because, as I shared earlier, I don't often feel like a kingdom carrier. I feel, you know, um, ordinary. I feel um, sometimes tired. I just don't feel like being a kingdom carrier. But, but I do believe that we are called to be salt and light. And even if your battery is feeling slightly flat and your light is, is perhaps dimming, You've got to know that you can come to the, um, the source of all life. You can come to the source of all uh, replenishment and restoration and know that he will and can restore you. That actually, it may be daunting to take his light into dark places, but as we do so, it's amazing. Yesterday I was, I was down at La Coupe and uh, we went kayaking and we were going over the, se- the kelp beds, the seaweed, and... Um, I don't know about you, but for the first time, I remember the first time I ever went over a kelp bed <laughs> and looked down into the deep ocean. Um, I, bearing in mind, I did grow up in South Africa, and in False Bay, we have the highest concentration of great whites in the world. I suddenly thought, what if a great white came from nowhere and just ate me? Um, and then, I, th- then, despite the fact there are many of them in, in False Bay, um, I, I held on to the fact that that was probably um, a slightly false fear, because... It wasn't, you know, the chances of me being eaten by a great white were quite slim, and even slimmer in Jersey. And I looked at um, Peter and Phoebe's face as we went over this kelp bed, and they w- I could see they were almost about to hyperventilate as they looked down, um, and they thought of whale sharks or whatever, you know, young children think of. And, 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 and they looked down, and, and they looked fearful, and I said, guys, this isn't going to happen, right? There's, we're not going to be eaten today. Daddy's not going to take you over like a great white shoal. You know, just trust me. Yeah, the worst thing you're going to see is a sea bass. And, uh, and, and, and they were both like staring into the middle of the kayak. And I said, guys, face your fears. Look at the kelp as we go over it. It's only going to get make it better. And, and they did, actually. They, they eventually faced their fears. But, but my point was, you know, initially when we see the darkness in this world, we can be fearful of it. We can be frightened of it. We can think, actually, I don't want to go there. I don't want to um, face down that alley. But actually, as we do as we shine God's light, as we shine God's truth into that dark situation, I believe that God gives us freedom, that he brings healing, that he brings restoration. And I want to just uh, look at this quick reading. This is the, um, the final reading we have today, which is going to come up on the screen. 
Matthew chapter 5, it says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And there's a picture. I just want to, want, um, uh, Laura, if you could put that picture up, that'd be great, please. This is a picture. This is in Plemont. Um, this is one of the caves in Plemont. If you've never been to the caves in Plemont, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. In fact, you could go just before the baptisms at Grab de Lake. Not if the tide is in, by the way. Um, so that's Peter and, uh, and Archie, I think, running away from the darkness. <laughs> so I think I might have given him a fright at this point. <laughs> Hashtag just saying. So, so, um, so that, that's, that's one of the, the better caves at Plymouth. So you can go all the way in quite a long way. And, um, but it gets very dark in the end, so you can't actually see the, the last bit of the cave. Um, and, uh, and, and I said, Peter, I wonder what's in here. And, and <laughs> he ran away. But then... But then he, he, but then he, um, then he came back. If you just put the picture back up, please, Laura. The, it, then he came back, and I, if if you go to the back of that cave, so so I'm I'm facing um, the light at the moment. If you if you go, we're about halfway in there. I just took my phone out and got the torch up, and and actually when we when we got into the back of the cave, we realised that it was also just sand and rock. But but the issue is when you can't see that, when you don't expose it, there's a sense that it's something scary, isn't it? But actually, I believe that as we, as we surrender our lives, as we, as we hand our lives over, as we let God's light shine into parts of our lives that have previously been unexposed, actually, whatever fear that we had in that area can be changed, and, uh, and it no longer becomes really scary. And actually, uh, actually, there are areas, I think, in our lives where we sometimes have um, strong convictions about weak things. So, so like with our football team, you know, with all due respect, wins or loses, it's not going to change the world, is it? But then we have weak convictions about strong things, you know. Um, and, and I think that, that actually God's Spirit can give us that strong conviction about strong things and, and give us an uncommon courage. You know, I think, I think things I, I really um, think the Spirit of God g- gives us more of, which, which sometimes have to fight against our, our natural self, is more courage, um, you know, more, more courage to speak up, more courage to, to say things that are perhaps unpopular, more courage to speak about uh, things that maybe are going against the trend of, of you know, popular society. And, and I do think that uncommon courage comes from, from surrendering more of our lives to God's Spirit and actually probably caring less about what people think. And maybe that gets, uh, gets easier the more you practice it, like the more you stare at the kelp bit. You know, stare at that kelp bed of your life. <laughs> stare into the, the back of the cave and shine God's light on it because, because actually when you do, you'll realize it's not that scary. So, um, and, and the other thing is, you know, as, as kingdom carriers, I think we can carry God's kingdom into various places that other people can't go. And I've, and I've shared this before, but, you know, where Tim or John or Andrew uh, or Jen can go are places that I don't go. So they, they, despite their feelings, despite uh, the kind of day that they're having, they've got to know that that day they are a kingdom carrier into um, the places that they're going. Look at the person next to you and say, you are a kingdom carrier. And Andrew, I don't have anyone, so I'll say it to you. <laughs> you are a kingdom carrier. So I want to, um, I want to finish this morning seven minutes uh, seven-minute abs. Um, I want to finish this morning um, by 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 looking at my final point, which is being built together. So we're being built together um, as as living stones, as kingdom carriers. So so I- exactly a year ago, really to the day, I I um I came from my crutches, having um having snapped my Achilles tendon snowboarding, and and I and I went from the hospital, <laughs> having not. Um, walked on this leg for 12 weeks, nearly 13 weeks. Uh, I went from the hospital to my first physio appointment, which was um, on the town park, which is next to the um, Freedom Center. And I thought, well, I'll just park at the Freedom Center, pop my head in, see how things are going, because actually, um, you know, things are really sort of um, nearly finished. And uh, and I sort of hobbled hobbled out of the car, and I've been listening to a, a song um, 
called Glorious Ruins by, by Hillsong as I, was, um, as I was coming in there. And as I, as I came in, there were various workmen um, doing things. And I, and I looked around and I, and I thought, this is amazing because the words of the song, and I'd like to just get them up, get them up on the screen if you can do that, please, Laura. This is, um, you know there are various blackboards in the Freedom Center. I think this would look great on, on one of the blackboards. But, but the words go as follows. Let the ruins come to life in the beauty of your name, rising up from the ashes, God forever you reign. And my soul will find refuge in the shadow of your wings. I will love you forever, and forever I'll sing. And I thought of this just, just picture of this building that was being restored, you know, the Freedom Center, the former Odeon Cinema that was being restored. And, and I thought it's, it's, a, it's a kind of glorious picture of how God is restoring us, isn't he? So, so when, when, he, when, he, um, when God uh, takes control of our life, when we surrender control of our life, he, he gives us his Holy Spirit. But we're being changed, aren't we, from one degree of glory to another. So we're not finished articles. So that's good news, by the way. <laughs> you can look at your spouse or your friend or whoever you come this morning and say, you're not the finished article, which is good news, right? You're not the finished article yet. So we're all works in progress. So, so there's, a kind of, there's, a, there's a line in the sand where you say, I, God, I want to surrender my life to you. I've given my life to you. But actually, I realize that you're changing me from one degree of glory to another. That I'm not the finished article. Just like the Freedom Center is not yet the finished article. God is, God is actually taken what is an old building, and it's being restored for a, a, a community, for a community, for a family, for, a, you know, for, for people to get together. But it's just a building. Like in the Old Testament, they just had buildings. But actually, God is building His, his church, His people, as living stones. You know, as, as I looked around um, that building and, and actually bumped into to Mary that morning, I often meet Mary when Tim doesn't know. And, um, and, and, and I was just... You know, we just, I, just said to, um, I just said to Mary, you've done an amazing job here, you know, with, with Bex Legal. They, they, they just If you look around the, the, the foyer, it was just, you know, lots and bits and pieces that had been put together um, and, and, and built what was a really um, welcoming environment. And I looked at some of the, the artistry, and I thought, this is definitely not me, right? I, I don't have an artistic bone in my body. But I was thinking how God is building together His church and actually, he uses all of us in different ways to, 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 to be kingdom carriers. And, um, and as I thought about that, I thought, you know, back to my favorite story, Luke 15, where, where in every mini story in Luke 15, you've got something gets lost, something gets found, something or someone in the final story gets restored, and there's a party. And I think as, our, as God's church, as God's people here this morning, you know, we're all involved, aren't we, at some element along that spectrum. At people, at people, uh, people get lost, people get found, people get restored, and there's a party. And I really believe, it, you know, as God's church here this morning, that, that God is calling us to really be involved in some or all of those stages in people's lives. Because it's not about the building, is it? It's not about holier, it's not about the Freedom Center, it's about God's people, it's about His his living stones. It's about his, his Spirit living in us and working through us as we are kingdom carriers. And I want to finish with this story my dad shared recently about um, a famous church in the Hebrides where there was a revival, one of the, the best-known revivals in the British Isles history in 1949. And the, the church, the pastor was a guy called Duncan Campbell. And um, uh, what I didn't realize was, was my great-grandfather had been a pastor of that church um, before him. And um, so my parents last summer went up to that church in the Hebrides, which is where my dad's family is from. And, um, and they went into this church to, to ha just have a look around, and it's just a, s a small church. It's just a building. And it's interesting, the pastor there now said to my father that people now come from all over the world to this church to try and, you know, get a feeling of God's presence. And I thought that's quite ironic, isn't it? When God's presence lives in us, that actually we can get a feeling of God's presence every day as we welcome His presence into our lives, as we surrender our lives to His glory. He's changing us from one deg degree of glory to another. And we don't need to travel to the Hebrides, you know, thank you, God, to, to experience His presence. Actually, we can ex experience His presence here this morning. So I'm going to finish there. I'm going to invite the band up. 
And I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we, as we pray. And, um, and then Tim will be coming up uh, to share some words. But um, as I said at the start, I don't know, you know where you stand this morning, um, other than in a school hall in Holia. But, um, but I don't know what, what your week's been like or, or, what, or what your year's been like. Um, but I do know this. I do know that you know God, God is for you, that God loves you, um, that, that you're not here this morning by coincidence, you're here for a reason, uh, that God is building his church, that God wants to uh, further his plans and purposes in your life, that no matter how, how good or bad you think you are or how good or bad your past uh, you, you think is, you know, God is in the business of restoration, God is in the b- business of building his church. And, uh, and building living stones as we become um, temples of His Holy Spirit. So I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes now and bow your heads just for, for concentration and privacy. And, uh, and I guess t- two things this morning. I, uh, the first is, if, if you're here this morning and, and you're thinking, um, I would like to surrender my life. I would like to, to give my life to Jesus. In fact, I've been holding on too tight, too tightly. Um, I'd like to, to accept his gift of forgiveness. I'd like to accept his, his gift of, of freedom. Um, if, that's, if, you, if that's you this morning, I'd like you just to put your hand up um, and then put it down again, and I'm going to pray for you. If you just raise it and, so I can see it and then put it down again, I'll, I'll include you in this prayer. If you'd like to say, you know, God, I just want to give you all of my sin, all of my shame, all of my past, all of my... Um, all of the junk. If that's you, I just want you to put your hand up and then and then put it down again, and I'll I'll um, I'll pray for you. Thank you. And it, you know, if you're tired and and like we sung it, if you're tired and thirsty, and and you'd like to just just come to that spring of living water and, and drink this morning. And, the, and the, I guess the second area I'm going to pray for is, is if, you're, if you're here this morning and, um, and you know there is an area where you need to carry God's kingdom, be it a relationship, uh, be it a, a situation, a circumstance at work, um, be it an area in your own life where there has been, uh, I guess, darkness and a, a stranglehold just one area, then I want you to bring that to him this morning. And, and as an act of surrender, I just want you to put your hands out like this. And I'm going to pray, for, first of all, um, for those who raised their hand, and second of all, for, for all of us who are putting our hands up. So Heavenly Father, if you raise your hand, and, and if, even if you didn't, but you'd like to pray this prayer, um, please pray it in your heart after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus Jesus, I thank you that you are the only source of life. Jesus, I thank you that you came to bring forgiveness and freedom. And today, Lord, I want to hand over my sin and my shame. I'm sorry, Lord Jesus, for excluding you from my life up to this point. But I want to give you my life. I want you to take the driving seat. Lord Jesus, I just want you to be Lord of my life. And so I give you my life this morning. Give me your Holy Spirit, I pray. And help me to live the Christian life in Jesus' name. Amen. And secondly, I just want to um, I just want to pray for that one specific thing where you want God's light to shine, where you want his kingdom to be carried. Lord, I just pray that for that one thing in all of our lives, that you'd help us to carry your kingdom into that situation, into that circumstance. Lord, that you'd shine your light, that you'd take away any fear and you'd replace it with faith. Lord, that you'd take away any control and you'd replace it with surrender. And so, Lord Jesus, we just pray that your freedom would reign in that situation, in that circumstance. 